What's up, Vetters? Patrick here with Vetted. We've got a great show for you all today. NASA physicist Kevin Knuth uh, recently went on Danny Joe's podcast, and I've got quite a few highlights from the interview. Do we know anything about any of this stuff? Very little. This is so it's such a frustrating topic for me it's, sometimes. It's really frustrating. I think very, very little is known, and I think our government knows very little, and I think that's one reason why disclosure doesn't happen faster is because I don't think they know what to disclose. Really? Yeah. I really honestly don't. Yeah, I don't think because it's going to raise many more questions that they just don't have answers to. Let's get into it. we got a great UFO story from the 80s that he goes over. Um, he also talks about not really getting into anti-gravity research because he knows friends that have gotten into it and been threatened. It's been dangerous and he just kind of stays away from it. That's interesting. How many other people are being threatened? All right, betters, please hit that like button. That really helps out the videos. And of course, if you're not already subscribed, hit that subscribe button. I'm trying to get to 100,000 subscribers before the end of the year. First of all, are you aware of that stuff? And I'm like, aware of what, some what of it. Yeah, I've been, it? I haven't spent a lot of time looking at anti-gravity research. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something I've been interested in. Mm -hmm. And um, and it seems to be something that people don't want to study. For mm -hmm. some reason, there are you know, there are always rumors about people who are trying to study it who get harassed and, and worse. So mm. um, I've heard rumors like this that make me... Really? I'll stick with UFOs, and that's still not entirely safe. So, <laughs> but that's who maybe... Do you know people have been harassed looking into anti-gravity stuff? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Really? I know of people, yeah. Like academic people? Um, people in... I know some people in private companies who've done that, yeah. Really? So people that you've worked with and studied with and, and, uh, and to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. No, personally in one, yeah, certainly in, I know personally well in one case. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Again. So this idea that him looking at anti-gravity research, mainly because he's known people who have been threatened by it is fascinating, right? Just when you want to dismiss that, you really can't some going on there, some not right. Why would you be threatened by looking into anything? Right. That's so strange. Um, I'm curious what y'all say in the comments about this, because I found that this particular part may be the most fascinating of the whole interview, him saying that, to be honest with you. I think the implications are huge. Right. That's huge. How many other scientists feel the same way as Kevin? There's got to be more than one. And that's unacceptable. So pff, suppressing research right, into something. Why? Why? Even someone as skeptical as myself asks, why do that if there's nothing there? It doesn't make sense. All right, let's go to the next clip. Do you think it's possible that any of this stuff could be some like military stuff that we don't know about? No. No. No, absolutely not. Really? For one good reason. And the reason sitting on your shelf right over there, Richard Dolan's book on USOs. Richard Dolan has a new book on under yeah. unidentified submerged objects. Right. These yeah, things just, have been, yeah. These years. things have been observed by, and, and recorded in ships' logs for over 150 years. Mm. You have reports from the 1800s of a disc coming out of the water, hovering next to the ship, and then shooting off into the clouds. That's been going on for 150 years. Right. Yeah. But you can't. And once you know that those cases exist, mm -hmm. you can't just say it's got to be Russian or Chinese. That doesn't hold water anymore. It's silly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but don't you think it's possible that we could have got our hands on some of that stuff and like recreated it ourselves? So some of the mm -hmm. modern day things could be, could be modern secret mm -hmm. techno military technology. That's true. But the cases from the 1800s certainly can. That you can't explain away with technology. And so, right. so you can't, you you don't get rid of the extraterrestrial or non-human hypothesis by just looking at the military technology t yes. argument today. The 150 year old cases. You got to give that up. So again, this is so interesting. Um, now, I would disagree with Kevin a little bit. Some of it could still be tech, even though X, Y, Z, right, uh, brings up Richard Dolan's book, and and I get all that, and he makes a great point. But I would still say that there can really be no absolutes in this. It, you know, maybe not all of them. That that's what I think would be better. It's like, yeah, not all of them, right? But some of them could be, but not all, right? All of them. It's too many sightings. So the truth does have to be somewhere in the middle, which is fascinating. And the SCU team 
one of the studies that they did is they studied um, sightings at military bases, population centers, and um, and nuclear centers. And they've been they've studied those from the 1940s through the 1970s. And they have a series of papers on these things. Mm -hmm. And they found that um, the UFO the number of sightings at nuclear centers is statistically significantly more higher than the sightings at nearby air base, um, army or air bases mm -hmm. or population centers. These things are clearly hanging out nuclear sites. Yeah. And in fact, that happens early on. It starts actually when the nuclear sites were being created, when they started construction, which is really odd because mm -hmm. how did they know, how would anyone know what's going to be made there, right? So it's either clever enough to, they're either clever you're either like clever before, enough before the nukes were before actually the there. nukes were actually there the ufos were there watching and they stayed watching through like 1952 mm. and then dropped off and never re and those lever levels right. never came back so it was clearly we're watching the creation of these nuclear sites now the nuclear ufo connection is such a fascinating part of this topic because there's clearly something there all right, something there. What is that thing? But I've also always wondered why would nuclear explosions be so important to them? They're, they're so advanced. It seems like that'd be a drop in the bucket to them. Like, haha, look at them. They're playing with nuclear bombs. Like, haha. It's like us throwing a stone in, in a puddle. You know, it's like nothing. That, that's how I imagine it. I mean, because we have nuclear reactions going off in, the, in space all the time. The sun, hello. Uh, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't understand. Why is it so important here? Are they just worried we're going to hurt ourselves? Or, I mean, that, that's really kind of the only thing because to them it would be nothing. But in our hands, it's like, yeah, that's not a good idea. That's why the kids with matches theory does kind of, it's like to them it's not a big deal, like a match to us, but you give it to a child, not, not such a good idea, right? So, you know, I'm starting to believe that more and more, honestly. All right, now let's get to this last clip, which is uh, Kevin and Danny discussing this old case from the 80s in Japan. It's absolutely fascinating. Kevin loves it. Danny loves it. I love it. Let's hear a little bit more about this case. But then you have stories like that, uh, the 60s Japanese airline flight, or, or it's in 1986. 86, is that yeah. when it was? Yeah. And I think it was a cargo plane flying through Alaska. And they said that these, uh, they, first of all, he said there was these two little lights that like came up and were darting around in front of them. And, like, yeah, they were little rectangular lights and they were like scanning yeah. like this, but shining the light beam right. into the cockpit. And yeah. it was hot yep. and scaring the pilots. I and mean, the this, pilot yeah. th just said that he reached into his briefcase to pull a camera out to take a photo of them and they just vanished. And then a couple minutes later, this mothership shows up. That's like the <laughs> size... The this it's the size of a like football a walnut, stadium or it was something. The, it was yeah, it's the size, shape of a walnut. It's about a thousand feet diameter. He drew an I mean, amazing huge. Uh, uh, he he drew an amazing illustration, Steve, of how big it was. He drew a picture of the plane that he was flying compared to the size of the craft. Right. Which is, you could probably find it on this Wikipedia article, or if you type in the guy's name, the pilot's name, and the Japanese Airlines cargo flight, he. Yeah, Kenji Tarachi. It is insanely big. Uh, okay, it's the yeah, this little sketch on the top, I think. Right. Those two. Those are the two rectangular no, th things, it. and then yeah, he's another sketch. It looks like a napkin sketch. You'll know, you'll know when you see it. Copy. Um, but yeah, that uh, that that's something, especially in the '80s, like something that big is like I don't know. No, I don't the, know. No, if the that amazing could be thing about the amazing thing about this is that the radar data exists. And you can analyze the radar data. From that so incident. From that incident. Mm -hmm. They have 45 minutes of radar data. And the um, a lot of it was confiscated by President Reagan's scientific team and the CIA and the FBI. Really? They all came up to confiscate it. But the um, but um, I'm blanking on his name. Oh, yeah, yes, that's it. The craft. That's it, Steve. Yeah, the big walnut thing. It's a little bit thing. low quality, but... You probably... I, got an, I got an image of the guy, too. Oh, beautiful. Pull up the... Uh, can, you, can, you, can, you, can you blow it up? So we, so we could show it to people. Look at that. So, so yeah. So you Cal see Callahan. Look is at the, that. That is insane. That, that is thing insane. is like that's that's like a hundred times the size of the airplane. Exactly. You could fit a hundred of those airplanes inside that thing. And so you know, and so when people 
you know, are skeptical of this. I'm like, how wrong can this guy have been? Okay, so maybe he's off by the size by 20%. <laughs> you know, yeah. For that to become a reasonable story, right. he would have to be off by so much. Right, right. I mean, right. Great. And he describes it as it moved in front of the plane. You couldn't see out of the cockpit. The craft was there. I mean, it was, it's terrifying. And he was terrified in talking to the you know, traffic control. And I would be too. I mean, that's terrifying. How did the story get out, I wonder? And... Um, do you imagine they would Yeah, want I don't to remember exactly how it came, came, got out. It got out pretty quickly, and oh, they really? weren't able to put the lid on it. Yeah, and um, and then Callahan had to turn the all the materials over to Reagan's scientific team, and then um, but he had kept copies for himself, stashed in a box under his desk, and he kept it under his desk for like twenty years. Who while did? He worked, um, John Callahan, who was the. FAA chief of accidents oh, and investigations. Okay, yes, yes. And he kept that material for like 20 years and then released it publicly. All right, veterans, look, I'll put a link down below to go check out this full interview in the Danny Jones podcast. Um, absolutely phenomenal. Highly recommend it. It's two hours if you want to check out the full thing. They cover a lot of stuff. And Kevin, just nuts and bolts, not, no drama, just talking to UFOs. Very reliable guy. I, I find him to be quite credible, to be honest with you, and quite. Um, interesting to listen to, to be honest with you. So anyway, all right, better leave your comments down below. We'll see you in the next one. Remember, every day's a gift, y'all. Peace. Peace.